Good afternoon. It is afternoon this time around. Welcome to Econo Thrive Global Conversation. So today uh, we have two guests, uh, Mrs. Tulim Hlungu from South Africa, and we also have Pastor Darren Leon Green Harris. It's a, it's a morning in the in the United States of America. So good morning, Darren. Good afternoon, Tuli. Welcome to ITG Conversations. Thank you guys for making time to join us today. We're talking about a big one, uh, mental health mentors. It is big in South Africa. It is big in the US. It is big in the whole world, you know. So let me give you an opportunity to introduce yourselves because you know yourselves better. So Tuli, I'll start with you. Thank you, thank you Zodra. Good morning, Jaren in the US. Thank you for joining us. Um, good morning, everybody. Zodra, like you say, this is huge. I will say it's huge personally in my life. Um, I am a mental health user. Um, that's what we are called in South Africa. I'm some, somebody living with a mental, uh, ill health issue. Um, Uzot, I suppose, will ask me more questions about that. I'm a mother of two. I'm a wife. I am a business person. I'm a social entrepreneur. So um, mental health is a huge issue in my life, but it's not the only issue in my life. And I'm sure when we start having that conversation, that's going to come out um, totally. But I really appreciate to be here and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Tuli. Darren. Well, good morning and Yebo. <laughs> it's early morning <laughs> uh, in the States. And uh, I really appreciate, of course, uh, Zadwa for the invitation and all those who coordinated. And it's good to see my friend, Tuli. I haven't seen you in several years since we've been on the stage uh, at the, uh, the Business Expo in Durban. Mm -hmm. Uh, for the Essence uh, Music Festival, that collaboration, which was great. So it's good to see you, uh, and it's always good to follow you as well. So good morning, everyone who's joining us, no matter where you're joining us in the world, we welcome you here this morning. It's going to be a great conversation, and we're going to talk about some things, and uh, we're looking forward to it, Zabo, so we turn it over to you. Thank you for having us. Great, perfect. So let me just... Um Look at the statistics here. It says an estimated 400 million people worldwide suffer from mental or neurological disorders or from physiological problems. So it's a huge number, you know, um, but it is not something that um, people are free to talk about. Um, so maybe let's just start with looking at the types of um, mental health challenges. You know, you hear people throwing depression, throwing bipolar, anxiety, schizophrenia. So can I just maybe, you know, get uh, the two of you to go, maybe truly you take um, bipolar. What is bipolar? Okay. Um, thank you, Zodra. Um, so um, maybe I should start with saying, um, I'm gonna talk about bipolar and my experience. So in 2011, I was diagnosed with what the doctors called bipolar two. Some people will call it a mild disorder, um, a mild bipolar because there's bipolar one, um, which is quite a severe, and then there's bipolar two, and then there's another type of bipolar, and I'm sure Darren will, will um, remind me of it. But I have been diagnosed with what they call bipolar two. Now bipolar in itself, whether it's bipolar one or two, basically means that you're somebody who is living one with a chronic illness. So my brain is sick. So I start there. You know, it's as simple as that, just like everybody who's sick. But what happens with bipolar is that the reason they call it bipolar is that I vacillate between two polar opposites. So it's either I am high, I'm excited, I'm excitable more than the normal person which can lead to some reckless behavior of doing some things that you might look at me and say it's not normal, right? Or when I'm sad or I'm low, I am one of those people who can be so low and I go into depression, depression that if not treated will go into, you know, sometimes having suicidal ideations, which is, or trying to commit suicide. 
So that is bipolar. And what happens is that at the moment, I'm in a place where with the help of mental health practitioners, I am on medication that is bringing me to the middle. So they, the middle, which is what they call a normal. So I know there's nothing normal. Um, everybody's, you know, is different. But that's the simplest way I can, I, can, I can explain bipolar. So it's people who have a mental condition where they are um, untreated. You vacillate. You know, that's why sometimes they say we are moody. You either you're high or low and you are not able to control your moods like other people. So I hope that is clear. Um, I will answer more yep. questions. So, so we also, you know, I have a little question. We're live on Facebook. So we'll just go to our Facebook page and take questions there. Uh, yeah. Erin, um, your book, Living Life, Living wow. a Legacy. <laughs> <laughs> And then the first thing that you see is that, okay, um, you had some like challenges and you were just ready to call it quits. And, um, you know, you were at a stage of, um, you know, considering completing suicide as it were. And um, yeah, you, would you like to maybe tell us about your own experience? Yeah, well, you can hear me loud and clear. Everything's yeah. good. So first of all, thank you, uh, Chuli, for your uh, bold um, you know, declaration. And I got to say this first, because it's really important to lay this groundwork uh, as we begin this conversation, because there may be some people who may be listening. Uh, so I want to put some disclaimers. You'll hear some things, and we'll talk about some signs and symptoms. But it doesn't necessarily mean that you may have a mental or behavioral health uh, challenge. Uh, some people call it a disorder. So you have to see a physician. So I want to just go ahead and uh, point yeah. that out. Uh, it's not even that, you know, your pastor can diagnose. You have to see a medical professional who is trained uh, in these things because you're going to hear something and you say, oh, I was, you know, depressed. But it doesn't mean that you, you know, live with depression. And I try to steer away from words like suffer uh, with depression or suffer with uh, bipolar. So I wanted to start off by saying that. And if you're listening to us, uh, it doesn't matter where you are in the world, uh, what my message has always been that there's help, there's hope, and there's healing. And you don't have to suffer alone. You don't have to suffer in silence because we talk about Zero Sigma. It was an organization that we had embedded in our nonprofit uh, once upon a time. Uh, but the, the message is still true. There is no shame and no blame as it relates to mental or behavioral health challenges. So I wanted to go ahead and put that out there uh, before sharing a little bit of my story. Uh, and we alluded to some, of course, some of those uh, diagnoses, uh, which you know, the bipolar and schizophrenia, you know, uh, you have anxiety. There's so, there's so many uh, uh, that is described. And so it's really important, once again, that a medical professional uh, gives you that diagnosis. So for me and my journey, uh, it, I, if I had to look at my life, I would have to trace it back from being a very young person, a, a child almost, um, and seeing some of the patterns and some of the behaviors. And just like uh, to me, you know, I was diagnosed with the same uh, type of mental health challenge. And with that comes, you know, with bipolar, you know, as she always stated, stated it's like being on either one extreme or the other extreme. You either all the way this way, all the way that way. Uh, and there are times when you are experiencing something called mania, where you can just take over the world and you can do so many things and your brain is nonstop. It's moving, it's moving. So, you know, there's, there's this manic period or there's this really uh, depressive period where uh, you literally, uh, you know, you become immobile, you can't get out of bed, uh, you lose your will to live, desire to do things that you enjoy doing. Uh, so these are just some of the things, but they're racing thoughts uh, that happen. Uh, there's this agitation that I've experienced, you know, and I can only speak from my, you know, experience, and especially as a leader, yeah. as a leader, um, and this is my experience, strength, and hope, because I want to leave uh, a message of hope, too, uh, because a lot of times, you know, in leadership, especially for me, it, and in my community, let me go a little bit further back because we were taught, I was taught, that there's some things that you just don't talk about. There's some things that you should not say. Uh, and, and I was told as a young kid, you bet not say nothing. 
you know, and it's attitudes like we don't say anything, the stigma begins to grow and exist. And so there are those who are living and suffering in silence with their mental or behavioral challenge because you bet not say nothing because of that particular culture and attitude. So we have to start to break down all of that. And when you get into the church, that's a big subject too. Uh, and so I'll probably get in a little trouble because there's some people, you know, that says, you, you know, you don't have enough faith, you know, and at the time I experienced, you know, several of my episodes of mania and depression, you know, I was in leadership. I was pastoring the church. I was a CEO of a healthcare company. I mean, all of this in real time. And yeah, I wrote about it. So, you know, there's no shame, no blame. And part of the reason why I share my story, Zago, and why I wrote my story and why I was able and so blessed to meet uh, Julie at, in, in South Africa for that wonderful conference was because uh, I made it my mission uh, to let people know that we have to say something there, you know, and if you're experiencing these uh, mental health challenges or you're experiencing uh, any of these symptoms or these signs, you, know, you have to get to a medical professional so you can get diagnosed because it, it really is serious. And all throughout the Bible, we actually see examples uh, where there are individuals, where prophets and leaders, uh, even Jesus for a short time, right? He said, take this cup away from me, right? Uh, but he remembered what the ultimate goal was, which was to save humanity and to bring, of course, uh, hope, help, and healing. That, that's his message too. So it was to save the world. Uh, but in that, he had to be very transparent. That's why we read it. That's why it's in the book. That's why we see him in the Garden of Gethsemane. That's the reason why, to let you know that if Jesus can go through these periods and, and have these challenging times, you know, if Moses can go through this, if Elijah can go through these things, right? You see it all throughout the Bible, um, you know, and it's just really important that we address it because what we, we don't want, we don't want anyone to uh, prematurely lose their lives or take their lives because here's what we know, and I'll shut up after this unless you have another question. Uh, it says that Jesus has come that we might have life and life more abundant. And when you are living with the mental or behavioral challenge and it has not been diagnosed and you have not, you know, sought out the appropriate treatment, uh, and that could just sometimes be therapy, it could be medication, it could be a combination of both, uh, you, you can't live the fullness. Uh, and so I want to say that because I know there's some people and there are faith people, you know, healers who will say all you need to do is just believe. You don't believe enough or something's going on in your life or what's happening in your life where you're not uh, praising God enough. And, you know, we, we get a lot of that. And, and hence, you know, it further, it further uh, separates those individuals who are seriously with a medical condition, uh, because we know it's a medical condition uh, that, that they're challenged with. So I just wanted to share that. And yes, it is a part of my story. Yes, it is in my book. And thank you, Zadwa, uh, for pointing that out. I appreciate it because I don't have a copy with me, but I wanted to share that. And I tell that story uh, in several different phases and how I got there. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Darren, that, um, uh, for, for that input. Uh, Tuli, let's bring this back to the South African context, the church. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and I'm sure you've had your own experiences in church <laughs> where it comes to this um, uh, particular subject matter. Would you like to perhaps maybe share your own experience in this regard? You know, um, Zodo, when you start talking about this, I can feel my heart beating fast um, yeah. because this is a very um, difficult conversation for me because I think I'm just recently finding my way back to Christ um, because of the experiences that I've had, you know, with my mental ill health and, you know, the interpretation of the church of, of, of the person, you know, that I am. I'll, I'll just start, you know, I think Darren has, you know, hit the nail in the head in that I think, um, you, you know, th there's different interpretations and the different interpretations of how you need to be if you say you're in Christ and therefore you cannot suffer. Um, I hold on very strongly to the words of Christ that says, come as you are, you know, to me. That has helped me a lot. But let me talk about my story. For a long time, I have run away from the church, especially when I'm in my hypermanic state. 
or in my depressive state because most of the times I've tried to come, I've tried to go to church. I would feel, I know maybe a lot of people never intended to make me feel like this, but I would feel some judgment because when I got born again and I was part of the church, I got this, um, maybe because of my personality, I don't know, but people started calling me a woman of virtue. Um, and you know, when you start being called a woman of virtue, there's something that you identify with. You think you need to be perfect in people's sights. There's certain things you need to do. You need to be able to pray, right? You need to be able to go to women's leadership conferences. You need to be able to pray with the mic, you know, and people must yeah. see that God is moving in you. When, um, yeah. I think as Darren says, when I started being symptomatic, when I started being hypermanic, which is your irritability, doing things that I didn't understand or starting being depressive, all of a sudden that woman of virtue thing, maybe I was self-judging myself. I just felt not worthy. And whenever I tried to say to people, listen, I'm in a point of not feeling worthy, the question would be, are you fasting? Are you praying enough? Truly, you've opened a door to your family. Mm -hmm. um, check what door you've opened. Um, I, I remember there's a time where I actually stood up at some point and went to church when there were, was a call to, uh, for prayer. Remember, I was also a leader in church. Yeah. And that was the last time I went because when I said how I was feeling, I was feeling hopeless and I wanted out, um, that was translated into me having demons. I remember I was being prayed for being hit and you know people saying um, and that becomes difficult because although they're doing what they know it doesn't yeah. help me yeah. because it never shifted me to the fact of accepting that I have a mental ill health issue all it yeah. did it just made me feel I was unworthy to be in the church and therefore because I'm unworthy as I am because mna, when I look around at everybody else in the church, especially other women of virtue, they, they seem to have their act together. But I just didn't feel like I had my act together. And what happened is I started not finding church very useful for me. Yeah. And unfortunately, when you've grown up in the church and you were born again, when you start pulling away from fellowship with other Christians, sometimes it affects your, your connection with God. Because I, I find that now... Yeah where I am, relationship with God is much more important than me and religion. So I'll just end it here for now to say where I am now, I'm in a journey of finding relationship with God and not being religious and, you know, trying to, to fit all those, you know, that there's a scripture, there's a scripture and a psalm that I actually, I will say this without fear that I had started to hate Proverbs 31 a proverb said in one woman, because I couldn't see myself in that woman at, in the times that I was struggling. So I think um, th that's where I am, Zodra. It's a journey that's not complete, but I am thanking God for lockdown, guys, because lockdown, for some reason, has allowed me not to feel guilty about not being in a building of the church. Now I can fellowship online. Now I can work on my own salvation without fear and trembling, without Abazalwana asking me which church I go to. Now I just fellowship with every Christian online. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I'll leave it there. Okay, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Tuli. Thank you, Darren. Um, now at this point, I'd like to go to our Facebook Live and just see if we've got any questions. We've got quite a number of people that are watching today. Okay, I have a question from Sue uh, Mkwanazi. What is a parent's role? What assistance can they give if their child has been diagnosed with depression? I think this one is for you, truly. <laughs> because yeah, I mean, you've, you've, uh, you've had a, a, an experience yeah. to this effect. Yeah. Um, yeah, I will just say before I speak this, I'll say, Moe do your thing. Um, you know, when, when I share, I don't want to share from my head. I want to share from my heart because this is important. And again, I want to stress, this is sharing with no shame, no stigma. This is something that we are walking with. 
Um, thank you for your question. You know, I think that is very important. Um, I was sort of expecting that question. So um, let me share my story first so that I just share some, so that, you know, I have credibility when it comes to this question. Okay. Last year, um, and like actually oh, September, oh, uh, what's the month before September? January, February, March, April, May, June, July, uh, August. August. <laughs> yes. On the 3rd of August, I woke up um, to a message on Facebook. Um, basically, it was my daughter who lives in the US sending an SOS. And um, she was um, really talking to herself. I think she was reflecting, but in her reflection, she was reflecting about her calling of what she's doing in the US, but also saying that she has found clarity after she had tried to commit suicide five times while she was there. Now, um, you can imagine how that makes you feel as a parent. I'm sitting here in South Africa, I'm waking up on a Sunday morning to a Facebook post from my daughter, who is literally 24 hours away from me. Even if I wanted to get to her, I can't because I have to get, uh, anyway, trip to the US, but to cut a long story short, my life changed on that day when I saw a message from my daughter, because remember before that I was dealing with my own mental ill health issues. Yeah. I had never thought that my children were dealing with those issues and she was dealing with it so bad that in the one and a half years that we thought she was living and thriving in LA, she had attempted to take her own life five times. Now, going back again to the question is, as a parent, what helped me through that time, because it took me about a week to get to her, was holding on to the hope that she had attempted five times before that. And my job at the time as a mother was to remind her of the five times she had decided not to take her life, which meant that there was hope there. So the first thing I had to do was to not be dramatic about it. Um, thank God that I had already gone through the journey of mental ill health myself because I knew that she was not being dramatic. Um, it was something I had to accept. So we had, I had to deal with the fact she's in danger now. How do I walk her through the situation until I get to her? So um, for that week, I was talking to her every day, but reminding her of what stopped Yumdanam from jumping because she wanted to jump off a bridge. And you know, when your child starts finding what she wants to live for, I will say she because it's my, my daughter. Yeah. I would say that's your job as a parent. You know, um, don't minimize your child's pain. I know sometimes you want to say, hey, you are going to get in Ghana, let's just put them private school. Says, in eh, don't say, when I'm not going to get depression. I would say, as a parent, one, accept it. Accept it like you would have accepted a diagnosis of your, your child living with insulin um, disorder, which is diabetes. It's as simple as that. Your child is sick, and as a mother, find help that will help your child focus on the positive. Because again, like Pastor Darren is saying, it's about hope, health, and healing. Um, and that the last thing I will say is one of the things that I've discovered from my daughter's journey is that when they suffer from depression, sometimes we as parents don't want to look at it because we are the triggers sometimes as parents. And it's difficult to look at that, very difficult. I'll leave it at that, daughter. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Tuli. Um, so let me also just check um, if we have any other. Okay. I have a question from uh, Pumzile. Many Christians struggle in silence with depression and some are bipolar. How can churches train their counselors? Fundis. Um, <laughs> this is a, a very deep conversation for me. Um, I, if I can, I want to add some value to what Julie has already said. Yeah. And I want to speak uh, from the voice of the child. Yeah. And what's helpful 
for parents. Um, because I, I can't really uh, understand, you know, uh, how my parents have had to navigate through uh, those periods and times. But what was most important is that they were available, that they were there, and that we created together a crisis plan. So that, that still today, as an adult, I have to exercise. Um, because um, even though there are certain therapies and treatments that you know, those living and, and who have accepted their diagnosis and, and, and going to medical professionals uh, to, to, to deal with their diagnosis, uh, it doesn't mean that you're free and clear. And so it's very important because it, it's not like you take an aspirin for a headache, right? Yeah. Um, this is something that is ongoing. And, and as I was listening, you know, the support of parents, and that was one of the things that we did in uh, Louisiana, uh, as I was the CEO of a healthcare company that focused on peer support, uh, family support, and the importance of family involvement. Because when a mental health crisis happens to a child, it happens to the entire family. Uh, and that's why it was important for us to have what we call home and community-based services, because crisis doesn't always happen at the clinic. It's happening in the community. It's happening at church. It's happening at school. It's happening on the playground. It's happening in their natural environments. And so it was important for us to identify parents who had similar life experience. And this can be done anywhere in the world. It works. Peer support, family support, it absolutely works. And so when you ask the question about churches and what they can do, I'll kind of blend that in as I talk about this. But, you know, the most important thing that my mother did for me, and, and, and I'll say my stepfather did for me and my father, and, you know, I have a lot of parents, you know, uh, from everywhere, even uh, a lady I call my Mary. And, you know, I have many people who, you know, ha have adopted me uh, yeah. and who know my story and I've shared my story. And it, first of all, let me say it was a very uh, difficult thing to do because when you're seen as a leader uh, and you're supposed to be strong and you've been in the faith and you, you know, and all of these things. And so you're starting to, you know, even question your call. All right. Okay. So, but my uh, mother, I'll finish it up. I'm, I'm sorry. It's okay. just emotional. So oh, my right. mother yeah. was very valuable in this process and still is today. Yeah. And so it's really important that if you're a parent, that you believe your child when they say they feel a certain way, when they say say a certain thing. It's very important to pay attention. And I know there are a lot of good parents and you're out there. And a lot of times because we don't want to talk about it, we don't say anything, or maybe it's embarrassing to deal with, you know, well, you, you as a parent, uh, you know, you are so important because if, if I hadn't had that time, uh, if I hadn't had, you know, a mother like I had, who, who, who recognizes and sees, and still today uh, with her mother's intuition, she can feel stuff. She probably feels what I'm feeling right now. So I'll get a text in a minute. Are you okay? You know, the check-ins, as annoying as they can be, as you grow older, I'm almost a half a century, but it, I thank God for those people. And if you don't have, uh, let's say your parents are still alive, but you have to identify a, a network of people uh, who you can be completely honest with, completely transparent and authentic, because look, this is about our lives. And, you know, once again, Jesus came that we might have life and life more abundantly. And so you have to have a support network. So I wanted to say that. And what can churches do? What can church? First of all, the first thing that I would say to any church is to get educated. Get educated because you have to get awareness of what's going on and understand that it's not just the devil. You know, <laughs> you know, we want to, it's easy to blame everything. And I'm not trying to, you know, just make fun of, you know, how uh, sometimes our tradition does, but it's really important to understand that there are chemical imbalances that happen. We also have to understand that there's something called post-traumatic stress syndrome. Uh, there can be an accident where someone, uh, you know, may have hit their head and, you know, there could be a shift. There are many different reasons that could lead to a mental behavior health challenge. Right now, the entire globe, the entire world is now in a position where, you know, it's situational depression that's happening. I mean, you know, and so people 
people are, you know, losing people. There's a lot of grief that's going on. And that doesn't mean, you know, we all experience grief. But if you're experiencing for a very long time and you can't get out of these cycles and, you know, you're not able, you know, to move forward, you know, those are the times to, you know, I suggest you see a physician. But churches and pastors have to be supported. You've got to get educated. And when you get educated, after you get educated, you have to show that you support. See, it's one thing to say I support you. It's another thing to show that you support. You know, it's not enough to say, just say, I love you. You have to show people that I love you. And a part of our work as the church, because here's what I believe, absolutely 100% without a shadow of a doubt, we have been called to reach out to all marginalized communities, just as Jesus did, and, and bring them closer to the center of God's love. You know, it doesn't matter. You know, we have to do it to the least of these. And so it doesn't matter if they're living with a mental behavioral challenge, if they've been incarcerated, you know, if they've, you know, anything. Because first of all, let me just, let me make the level feel, uh, you know, I, I want to level out the playing field. I want to say this, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, right? We, we all have made some mistakes. And so I want to say that, you know, we should use that and use our own experience, our own failures to, to, to empathize thighs with families and we don't have to look for we all have someone who we love who has been challenged with mental behavioral challenges uh, and may have even lost some people tragically i know in my life i have uh and in my professional world my personal world my pastoral world and so it's very very difficult so churches what they can do is eradicate the shame See, when we, we say that there's no shame and no blame as it relates to mental or behavioral challenges, what we do is we open up the door and, and we invite people in. You know how they say, open the doors of the church. When we publicly say that, what we're saying is it doesn't matter who you are, where you've been, no matter where you're on life's journey, you're welcome in this church. And the reason why you're welcome, because we understand where you, you've been. And even if we don't understand, we're going to love you until we can overstand together. You know, and so there are many things, and I have uh, many faith uh, resources that I'll share with you a little bit later, Zadwa, that we could utilize. But the first thing is just practice the principles of the Bible. It's just that easy. Jesus turned no one away. You know, and and when people needed a break, you have to recognize, allow them to have that space, allow them to have that what I call mental health moment. You know, I always had to be very honest, you know, whether I was the CEO of a healthcare company or a pastor in a church, when I needed a mental health day, or sometimes it could be a mental health week, you know, but I had to, I, the only reason I was able to be honest is because the individuals who supported me, you know, they, they, they were my network. And it's really important that we build nets that work. And so I'll, I'll just stop right there. Churches can do a lot. The first thing is just simply practice the principle of the Bible to love. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, if you don't love yourself, you, it's impossible to love your neighbor. So you, you need to have some self-love, but it says love God first. And if you love God, you can't help but love yourself. I don't mean to preach, but I, I just wanted to say that. I wanted to you know, share a little bit of hope because to let you know that that's the formula. Love is the answer. Love is the key. Love is All the right. answer. Yeah, no, you, you always say this, that uh, leaders who lead with love, they never lose. That's your uh, favorite tech line. <laughs> All right, let me go and uh, see what other question. Okay, so Simpiwe there is asking you specifically, Darren, how will you differentiate between a demon-possessed person and a mentally ill person? Yeah, um, and thank you for that question. You know, and how do we know if it's a demon? How do we yeah. know if it's mental health? Mm -hmm. Once again, here's what I'll say. You know, I'm not a medical professional. That's my disclaimer. But I've had enough medical professionals to, to work with uh, to know that they are the ones who can diagnose. Like, I, I, I don't believe that, you know, there, there are certain signs and there are certain symptoms when we know that it's mental health. So I want to start there. But yeah. I'll also say something that's very bold. Uh, and may uh, even cause a little tension within those who may be hearing uh, who are part of the church. And Zabwa, I love all of your guests and audience, and I hope y'all have me again. But here's what I want to say. 
Okay. We have to look when we read the Bible and we read it in content and read the content and the con and in context of the culture of that day. There are many things they didn't understand. They didn't have, uh, you know, the, the, the science uh, research that we have today. And so it was easy to see something that they considered to be abnormal or something different uh, as a spirit. Uh, and so you may have someone who may have had schizophrenia where or they displayed multiple personalities and they said that there were legion, there were many because they lived with multiple personalities. This is an actual diagnosis where people actually have multiple you know, personalities. And we have some people who haven't been diagnosed and we know them and they just, they, they have multiple personalities too. One in, in church, one minute they're this and one minute they're that. You don't want me to go there, but you know what I'm saying? So uh, the, the point is this, you know, only a medical professional, not even I, uh, and, I, and I've been around many and some great people and I've heard many lectures and read a lot of research. And, you know, at the end of the day, it is not up to us to determine uh, if if we're not a medical professional, because I may have some listening to us. If you have not been trained and you're not a medical professional, it is not our job to or our responsibility to try to diagnose someone if that is not your duty, you haven't been schooled or trained on it. And so even as people come in church, and I've had this happen because uh, most of the time the ministry that I, you know, pastored uh, was in a homeless community. And so there are homeless people there all the time. And homelessness is a byproduct of mental health uh, or other illnesses, right? And so we knew that. And so I, there were many people who came. Uh, whether they were living with a mental behavioral challenge or a substance abuse, you know, all of these kind of impact one for another. And so, you know, people living with a mental or behavioral challenge, they'll self-medicate or people who self-medicate, you know, they'll end up having, you know, a mental behavioral challenge, or it could just be that life showed up. It could be genetics. I heard, you know, a story earlier today where genetics was a part of it. Uh, and so all of these things have to be taken into consideration, but here's what we have to be clear on. You, you know, a mental behavioral challenge, or it could just be that life showed up. It could be genetics. I heard, you know, a story earlier today where genetics was a part of it. Uh, and so all of these things have to members, uh, pew members, you know, or online. We want to educate them on it. But at the same time, if you're not a medical professional, you cannot diagnose. And so that would be my response to that. Uh, and, you know, that it's not always a, a demon and one of the things that would separate me or, or make me not want to go to church is if i'm really you know feeling really depressed and let's say i'm on the low end of the spectrum they call it the spectrum bipolar spectrum and i'm not feeling well and someone came to me and said you just don't have enough faith you're not believing you need to pray more you need and i pray a lot and i do all of these things a lot you know and so I want to say to those who may have heard that, I, I apologize on the behalf of the, the, the church because that is not Jesus' response. It is not how I believe Christ would respond. I never read where Jesus turned people away. In fact, he was always summoning, summoning them to come to him. In fact, even the little children, he says, suffer the little children to come unto me, but such is the kingdom of God. We can learn a lot from children. You know, I think something we, we start losing too many brain cells or something as we get older and we forget what the Bible says. Love is the answer. Yeah. I'm going to stay on love. Okay. All right. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I hear you. I hear you, uh, Darren. Truly, I think maybe yeah. let me bring you here because you've already mentioned um, what you went through, you know, so it's probably going to be important to bring in the South African context here. Uh, perhaps it's not a question of, um, the faith leaders not wanting to be embracing, but they actually do not know what to do, you know. Uh, so I just want to bring you uh, uh, to Lila to maybe, you know, just, you know, touch on your own personal experience in this regard. I, I think I, I agree with, with you, um, Zoja, there, because um, I, I just want to say something um, because it will give context to the question. You know when you you you, you invited um, Pastor Darren to the Essence Festival. I don't even know how many years it was ago. He ran um, a social a social entrepreneurship session. 
Yeah. And I was sitting right there at the front. And at that time, I was at a crossroads in my, li in my life because I was exactly at the time that he's saying where you start, wh when you're living with mental behavioral challenges, you start questioning your calling. Yeah. Because, um, you, you know, and I was at that point, I remember I was sitting at the table and when we started, he started sharing his story. And he has this way of sharing his story. He was talking about a story where he drove a car, he drank alcohol, drove a car, and he was ready to just let go in life. And that story touched me so much um, that um, I asked him a question when he opened it up for the session and I said, you know, wait, wait, when is it okay to start sharing your own mental behavioral challenges and your own mental health issues? And the only thing I remember him saying was that if it's going to give somebody hope, if it's going to give somebody help, then there is no risk. Yeah. And because of that, I started the conversation called Masitete today. And it was exactly yeah. about that because I realized that all the things that I've gone through with, within the ch church, within the social sphere, was because people needed to be educated about my illness. People don't know, right? Yeah. And that yeah. includes yeah. pastors. You know, people are going about th the same way that their parents did, their own leaders before that. And that's how I'm finding the church goes, right? It's about prayer, it's about demons. And I think it's important what Pastor Darren is sharing that, you know, some of the scriptures, we need to read them within their context. And I think if we start educating our, part, our, our, our pastors and people in our churches, they, must, they, they will start opening up their doors and know that when I come to you and I say, I'm not feeling myself, the first place to go is not to think that I have a demon. Or, you know, as a woman, for example, one of the things that I've heard a lot is that I'm not praying enough. I am not covering my family enough. I'm opening certain doors to my family. And I couldn't pray. I couldn't pray because I was dealing with mental health challenges. And when I come to you as my pastor, as my counselor, I'm asking you to help me pray, you know, and not judge me that I'm not praying. So I would say we need to first in the churches, the pastors need themselves to start normalizing um, people who are living with mental behavioral challenges. I like this. This is what Pastor Daryl is saying. And I've learned this mental health behavioral challenges. We need to normalize this. We need to educate. Can you hear me? Yes, oh, I can okay. hear you. Yeah. So oh, mental okay. health Sorry. behavior. Oh. We need to educate our pastors, but also we need to use churches as places to advocate for also okay. those people with mental health behavioral challenges. And I think, you know, South African yeah. churches have done very well in terms of advocating for HIV and AIDS and creating those kind of outreaches. I think in the South African context, we could benefit from following that strategy because what Pastor Daryl is saying about no stigma, this is exactly what happened in South Africa when we were trying to fight the stigma around HIV and AIDS. Things shifted when yeah. we started having yeah. Uh, 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 yeah. um, wearing a, a T-shirt yeah. saying I'm HIV positive. Maybe we all have to walk around wearing T-shirts saying we, are all men we have mental behavioral challenges because we all have them in a certain way. So in to answer your question, yeah. in the South African context, we are very good at advocacy. We have strong community-based organizations. Our yeah. churches are strong yeah. community-based organizations. They need okay. to start right. advocating. Thank you. All right, is... thank you so much. Let me go to our Facebook page again and see if we've got any questions. All right, um, Nota Ando is asking here, what do we do as a church when in the body of Christ we have such narcissistic parents that are busy creating psychological being out of their children because we are, we are ignorant about such. We have too many children in the church that are dying inside but cannot talk to their parents. Darren, you've, you, you are a faith leader. Uh, you've, you've 
obviously uh, been a you know, CEO of a, 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 a social enterprise or a business that um, has been dealing with um, this kind of a challenge. So what can you, how can you respond? So speaking towards the church, correct? Like what can we do yeah. to further support? Um, here, here, I'll say, well, I always say this, um, that leaders who lead with love never lose. I want to yeah. say that. Uh, and leadership is about influence. Nothing more, nothing less. I have to say that. Yeah. Uh, and here's why. Because yes. it is the influence of the leader that sets the tone of any organization, any you know, any church. It doesn't matter. Faith, uh, nonprofit or NGO. Uh, so it all begins with leadership. And so we have to have leaders who are educated and who will have enough influence to begin to shift the narrative and, and shift the culture and our, our way of thinking uh, about this uh, very normal uh, health concern, health challenge, right? This is like diabetes, like we heard earlier. Uh, it is, you know, same as cancer. You know, it doesn't mean that you're a bad parent. It doesn't mean that you're a bad person, that you go through these things. None of that, you know, we have to remove the stigma. And that's why I say no shame, no blame, because there is a part in stigma where there is a shaming uh, that happens and there's not just external stigma, but there's also internalized stigma. And that is even more detrimental because, because of my, in, I, how I've internalized this, you know, I'm not going to get the help that I need. And because of the external things that says, you know, depression is bad or you've done something bad, you know, then those things have to be removed. And then the, the no blame is uh, targeted at the media. Right. And because many times we'll see certain movies or certain things and there there is a, a more stigmatizing going on because, you know, a person is living with a mental behavioral challenge and they're seen as someone who is cuckoo or crazy. And so it's perpetuated in the media or some mass shooting happens. You know, mental health is usually the first thing that happens, you know, uh, that they're talking about. And so that's the no shame, no blame. Now, as it relates to the leaders of the church specifically, uh, no matter what level of leadership you're on, but of course leadership starts, you know, uh, with the pastors in most cases, uh, we call them or bishops or prophets or apostles, you know, it doesn't matter what, whoever is the head of that church, you know, uh, it's really important that, and I hope you hear my heart on this, that you set the tone of this welcoming and this accepting environment of all people, no matter who they are, where they are on life's journey, make sure that the, the environment, everything you do, everything you say is is welcoming them that's what i learned in south africa over maybe 12 years ago in a small group these young people taught me about the spirit of akaya and when they said akaya i, I said well what does that mean they said well home but not like you americans think it means it's it's much broader and they begin to explain the essence of Akaya, which means it means home, but in a, a deeper sense where people are able to come to the table. It doesn't matter. All are welcome at the table, no matter who you are, where you've been. It, it's a sense of home where everyone is valued. Everyone has a seat at the table. And if you don't like the peas, you don't have to eat the peas. Pass them. You don't have to eat what's at the table, but you are welcomed here. So we have to have faith communities that are or welcoming and not just welcoming, but affirming. We affirm you for who you are, where you are, why you are. It doesn't make you demonic because you're living with a mental health, a behavioral health challenge. It doesn't make you a bad person. So I always thought the way I started is there are faith people listening to me. You can start with the basics, the Bible, B I B L E, basic instructions before leaving earth. B-I-B-L-E. Just want to throw that in there. And there's all kinds of stories. So if you want to have Bible studies on depression, you know, David suffered with depression. He battled over despair. You know, we saw Elijah. He was discouraged and weary. He was afraid. He, he said, I want to die. Now, he really didn't want to die because if he wanted to die, he would have just let, you know, he would, you know what I'm saying? He would have let Jezebel just kill him. But he didn't do that, you know, because he, someone was out to kill him. And so, you know, he got afraid. He had just had a major victory in his life, a major victory. And all of a sudden, now he's the enemy. He's scared. This major victory he just had. And now he goes in a cave and he says, I want to die. He didn't want to die. He wanted help. He wanted an answer. And, and many times when we hear people say that, you know, it is that SOS call. 
And so we have to be sensitive leaders and sensitive people in congregations when we hear that, when people say something, believe them, right? Don't just gloss over it and think that it's just something that they said. And, you know, so we have to do that and just recognize, you know, Jonah, he even got, he got angry and, you know, he, you know, even job, I'm sorry, Job, you know, he had suffered a lot of loss, a lot of devastation all at the same time. You know, it wasn't just one thing, it's one thing at the next, at the next. And so, but he, they never lost their trust or the faith in God. That, that is the, the one thing yeah. that I want to point out. And it didn't matter the people around them. They talked about them. Maybe they, you know, said negative things about them, but those were faith people. These were our people, and they continued to trust in God because they had the word in their heart. You know, that word hath I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. You know, be angry, but sin not. These are the things that we read. And by the way, no weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. Greater is he that is in you than he is in what we hear these things, right? And we have to constantly, I have to, let me speak about me. I have to constantly remind me that, remind myself that all things work together for the good of them who, who love God and who are called. And so I don't struggle with the fact whether I'm called. In fact, it is the reason why I'm called that I am doing, I'm having to go through what I'm going through. There's no more powerful leader than a wounded healer. We have been called to be wounded healers. How can we, how can we reach out to those living with a mental behavioral challenge if we had not been on that road? How can we effectively minister to people who experience loss if we haven't experienced that loss ourselves? See, that's the difference between empathy and sympathy. There's a difference. See, ministry happens on the level of empathy. See, sympathy is just saying, oh, I'm sorry you feel that way. But it's a deeper level. That's, that's what ministry is. Ministry relieves people of their misery. And that's what we've been called to do. And the only way we can do that is do, as Mother Teresa said, the only way that we can love them is we can't judge them. Because she says, if you judge them, you can't love them. She points the finger. If you judge them, you can't love them. How? You can't. So my answer, once again, is love. Yeah. Love is the way. All right. Let me go to our Facebook page again. I see Mondi um, saw me here. Oh, sorry, Zonda. Yeah. Sorry, Zonda. Okay. Can I just um, answer th that question um, before we go to the next question about um, the, the, the listener was saying how in, in churches we have adults who are not allowing children yes. to speak up. Um, I want to speak as a mother okay. who's also in the church and yeah. say one of the things that we need to think about is that we are also adults living with mental behavior challenges. And, um, you know, so sometimes we forget that even um, as adults, we need healing. So when, you know, that's why they say hurt people hurt others. So, you know, before I had to start the journey of walking healing with my daughter, I needed to deal with my own healing. And, you know, I just want to bring it to the young people to not forget that because sometimes as adults, we look like we have it all together. Pray yeah. for us too. You know, um, re, um, show us um, this podcast that is going to come up so that I, as your mother, can also listen to it and recognize I need to go and talk to a mental health professional. I'm going to say this, you know, when, when, when I was dealing with my daughter, I had just decided to go sober because I realized that every child deserves a sober parent. And this had nothing to do with my children. It had to do with how I was parenting them and how I could see that my behavior was not enabling them to live and try and, mm -hmm. and, and be healthy mentally. So I had to deal with myself first. And then I'm finding myself in a journey where my daughter's journey and my journey are parallel journeys. So mm -hmm. when, when you say in the church that we, we, we are not enabling our children to speak, we all need to heal together. So I would challenge the person who asked the question, raise the question in church and don't raise it at just about the young people who, who are hurting. Pastor just talked about post-traumatic stress disorder. We are a nation in South Africa that is living post-traumatic stress disorder. 
That's and right. uh, unfortunately, um, like he said, it's situational for us. Your parents are hurting too. Raise the question in the church, not just for young people in the church, but also for your leaders, for, for, for the other people in the church. So it's a community of healing that needs to take place. Thanks. That's good. Thank you. That's good. Wow. Thank you. We are all hurting and we all need to heal. My, my, my children like to say this thing. Sometimes when we're having conversations and we're not agreeing, because uh, I have a different point of view, and they say, hey, black parents. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe I get that to too. Something. Let me, let me go. <laughs> let me go to this comment here because maybe it is linked to that um, particular observation from my own kids. Ooh. So Monty here is saying, I think as people of color, we need to start going back to the drawing board and see and recognize the seriousness of mental ill health issues for what it is. We can't afford to keep on losing people to this illness as it's a very dark place. He is talking from personal experience, he says. All right. So is it a black parent thing? Is it, is it, is it like, yeah? Would you, would you guys like to maybe touch on that? And I know you would have a different, um, obviously take and experience, uh, Darren, but yeah, in the, in the South African context, you are black. <laughs> yeah. can, can, can I start here? Yeah, I please don't. Um, yeah, so, so for me, I would say, you know, he is correct and he's, you know, so there's no right, there's no wrong. It's just how it is, I think, yeah. in communities. And wh what I feel is, I think it's a human being issue because, you know, m mental health um, challenges are very, it's, it's a very personal challenge. It's a challenge that um, for you to heal, you need to look at yourself. You need yeah. to work at those things that are triggers. You know, um, for me, for example, part of my sober journey, which is I'm, I'm still walking, I thought I would miss the alcohol. I don't miss the alcohol. I am struggling with the feelings. I'm realizing now that the alcohol was about numbing the feelings, you understand? So there's a lot of things as human beings that we need to resurface and deal with them, but it's hard. And you know, most people when they deal with mental um, behavioral challenges, um, one of the things, for example, I usually say to people, and I don't know if Darren will agree with me, but with, with my experience with hypermania, I love being hypermanic. I will say it's controversial. I love it when I'm high and I can take over the world because I'm not afraid of anything. I don't think consequence. You understand? Um, this is why I'm saying, you know, when you see those people, people classify as mentally ill who are walking around South Africa, Bangdaga, they haven't washed, they're carrying um, uh, black plastic bags. They think that when Tuli says she's mentally ill, she's like that. That's untreated mental illness, right? But the truth is when you take Ubaba Loa, Omdaga, Omzise Kayum Buise, when they start becoming well, what do you notice? They want to go back to the street. It's easier there. I don't have to deal with family. I don't have to deal with hungry children. I don't have to deal with life. So I want to say that it's not a black family issue. It's a human being issue. It's just that in other communities, it's spoken of more. In the black communities, we only now starting to talk about because Mostly I'm finding in the communities that I work with, because we often say, people will say, don't tell me about um, mental illness and depression when we're dealing with bread and butter issues. We, we, we can't, we, you know, we can't even feed our families and now you're telling me about people who are depressed. So, um, so maybe it's black family issues because black families tend to weigh, I think, what they prioritize is important. I'll give it to Darren. Okay. All right, Darren. Okay, well, um, it is a cultural uh, thing. I'm, I'm going to try to say this without getting too emotional because here's where our worlds are so similar, but our journeys, of course, what brought our, our, our same people to the United States. So I want to speak from that perspective. And uh, that was a very challenging time, slavery. 
And so there are some things uh, that still impact us as a culture today. And it was always what we learned from the motherland to be strong. And you were not, not to show weakness. And if you're a man, you don't cry. You don't feel emotions because so, so now, you know, let's, we, I think we all can identify with that part. Be strong. You, you, you know, that's, we can identify. So now the other half of our family, we're on a boat and we sail over. We're separated from you. We're not going to, we're going to keep our same values because we were kings and queens. We're, we're, we were warriors and we still are. And we're not going to lose that in this journey. We're going to be strong. And, and so it doesn't matter. They, they whip you, they beat you. And so we were conditioned. Don't you show emotion. Don't you show feeling because it's a sign of weakness. And if we're going to be strong, even though we have been enslaved, we have to be strong. And you bet not cry. Don't show your emotions because if you show your emotions, then they win. And so that's been a part of the sentiment. And then you have the other dynamic where the homes are being broken up, right? So here's the culture. And I'm only speaking on behalf of you know, our culture, whether it's African or African-American or no matter what, it's, it's our culture. And we have been conditioned to just be strong people. And with the absence of a father, it makes things a little bit more complicated because it's left to mom and grandmother and auntie and all of them to raise us, which majority of the churches are full of women. They're predominantly women. I know in America it is, and I don't think it's too much different. Women are the backbone. I don't know why any man would have a problem when, like, I love you guys. So we need you. And like, but we were taught, we, we didn't, we were taught to just be strong. And so don't show your emotions, don't show your feelings. And so this is something that I, I grew up and, and I still have challenges with it. And so I have to do these therapies where I invite my feelings in and get in touch with my emotions and be okay with feeling the feeling and understanding that it, it's a feeling. And not all the time my feelings are a fact because, you know, the diagnosis I have sometimes, yeah, in mania, I agree with you. Like you can, you can take over the world. You know, and you can do a many, and I've been able to be very successful, and I'm sure to it, like many of those individuals that live with a bipolar diagnosis, we do wonderful things, but then there's the crash, you know, and then, you know, people are thinking, what's wrong with you? But, you know, there's this, this part where, we, you know, you're tired. But when we speak our truth and we publicly live our truth, then, you know, what we do is we set ourselves free and we set our families free and those who may not understand. I'll say this. When Jesus died, uh, he had a very public crucifixion that demanded a very public resurrection. So it doesn't matter who you are. If you, you've lived through this and, and challenged with mental behavioral challenge, know that, you know, yes, there'll be people who will crucify us publicly. They'll talk about us and say many things. But just as there's a public crucifixion, and this is for everyone, there's going to be a public resurrection because he promised us you know i always bring us back to our faith and our hope and so uh, hopefully i answered the question but i'm getting so emotional listening to this because we talked about culture and there's church culture there's african-american culture, there's all of this but i think it intersects all lines so if you're listening to us and you happen to not be black or african-american or africa or like zawa would call me colored you know it doesn't you know it doesn't matter you know it it we, we are all impacted by this. And so we, as faith people, if I'm speaking to all faith people, and even if you're not a faith person, I'm going to share my faith with you that, you know, this is the reason why God loves us and God made us. And, you know, this is who we are and we are wounded warriors. And so even though our culture may suggest one thing, we have to look at what these cultural barriers have done to us as a community of people, as a family. Because here's what I know, uh, Julie it, it expressed it. Like, you know, sometimes you see people on the street and they're on the street because it's a byproduct of their mental health. But what I also recognize working with children and families, when mental health is involved in a school system, children don't learn, they don't read. And so, you know what happens? The next thing is what? They're gonna drop out. So they're not, you know, they're not educated. What happens when you're not educated?
investigate. You don't have a job. What happens when you don't have a job? You probably rob still because you, you're trying to survive. And what happens when that happens? You go to jail. You see how all of this stuff impacts. Like seven, those days that 75% of prisoners in American jails, watch this, they can't read. And most of them can't read because of their mental behavioral challenge for whatever it is. You know, those are all these, we have to look at all of the systems. That's what I'm trying to say in a very subtle way. Like we can't just say it's cultural, but it's systemic. There are systems, you know, and there, there, there are a, a government things that to be done, uh, but we have to look at, yes, the church has uh, involvement, communities have an involvement, government has a role, but most importantly, we as the individual, me as one who's living with the mental behavioral challenge or a parent or someone's listening to us today, we all have a responsibility because here's what I know and I'll end with this. We can't fix it until we own it. And once we own it, we can fix it. So you don't have to suffer in silence. You don't have to live under shame or any type of blame because you know there are people who are bold and, and I've been watching, you know, Tuli and watching all her exercise and all the adventures. You know, this is exciting to me because you know to see how she can, you know, take her pain and turn it into power. You know, so that that's what that's the truth of the gospel. That's the good news that yeah. we can take our pain and turn it into our power. And watching you Tule, it's been a beautiful experience. And so keep doing what you're doing because you're inspiring me and you're encouraging me. You know, I like to do things that jump out of planes. Yeah, we'd like risky things. Uh, we'll take Zadwa next time, but, but you know, we're living out our life and expressing yeah. as God has given it to us. And this is the one he's given, this is our gift. And it, we're giving gifts, not just for us, but we're giving gifts to give to others. And so this gift that some people may call a diagnosis or whatever, I, I've removed all of that away because every day of my life, now people will stop me and they'll call or they'll text or they'll send a, a message via Facebook or something. And they'll say, thank you. Because of you, because you told your story, because we believe in telling a testimony, hallelujah, you know, we overcome by what? The blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. Blood of the lamb, word about, that's how you remain an overcomer. Like this isn't rocket science. Christ made this really easy. This is how we overcome as communities, as families. We gotta share our story because when we share our story, we bring the message of hope, health, and healing. See your eyes, Zadwa. Well, that's I say amen. <laughs> I'm trying not to preach. <laughs> wow. I wish we had more time for this, but let me just go to our Facebook page again and see. I have a comment here from Sharon. <laughs> Sharon, hey, what I'm what I'm taking from this conversation is that an integrated approach to mental mm. health is necessary. Faith-based organizations, mm -hmm. professionals and families need to work together. We must create spaces that encourage others who are struggling yeah. to reach out knowing that they will be embraced with love. It, it does seem to me that love, love is the way, yeah. love is the thing, you know, because if we do not have love as just people, uh, if we do not have love as faith leaders, if we do not have love as maybe social uh, uh, leaders, um, then it's gonna be a challenge. Let me just check if there's any other burning question or comment there before I give you guys an opportunity to give me your parting shots. I know, Darren, you you have a, a busy day there. What time is it now? It's probably almost eight o'clock. <laughs> It is past eight o'clock, but that's all right. I'm, I, this has been really helpful, and it's actually helping me to heal today, just in the space that I was in. So I want to say thank you once again, Zabwa, and thank you to and all the organizers uh, of putting this together. So you know, when when we do this, this it's heal. It's a healing process. That's why we have to do this. So I want to thank you guys for being a part of my medicine today, uh, my healing today. Thank you for allowing God to use you. Uh, to to give me this opportunity to get it out like this has been an amazing time so and good to see you guys of course as always um but this is really doing some powerful work that i'm gonna have to share in a different platform but because of you i am i am because you are 
And uh, I think, you know, that's my biggest takeaway uh, for anyone doing this work. And so, yeah, go on, look and see if there are any questions. I love you guys. I really do love you guys. Thank you. We love you too. Thank you. Yeah, Bo. <laughs> Clive, <laughs> a good friend of mine here um, who calls me his mentor sometimes. He says, if you love them, you can't judge them. I think you, Darren, were saying that because I think uh, most of the time also it's just being judgmental. Um, God bless you for doing this. Uh, oh, okay. So now this is probably an interesting one. Stu here is asking if self-medication has ever proved to work. <laughs> self-medication. <laughs> yeah. you started that but i would love to interject a little bit about it um I, I think it also depends on what to do means by self-medication because i'm not clear one i think like darren has said i'm not a believer of you taking any medication without talking to a mental health professional yeah. Um, you know, so when you sell self-medication, there's so many things that people will say you, you, you must do, you can take, and you'll feel better. Mm. Um, when you've been diagnosed with a mental health um, illness, your doctors come together and they uh, come up with a medication regimen that is suited for you. No one medication regimen will be will work for some somebody else. So now I always say people, people always say, can I have some of your medication or give me some of your antidepressants, you know? So I would say in that context, self-medication doesn't work. Go and speak to a mental health care professional, go to your clinic, they will refer you, right? So please, please, please do not self-medicate. Also do not self-diagnose. <laughs> go and talk to a professional and get the diagnosis. There's nothing as freeing as knowing what is wrong with you. So I would say go do that, right? Mm -hmm. um, I'll also take an opportunity to, to, to um, give my patting short here before, just in case we don't have it. Um, Darren, thank you so much. I'm feeling the love, bro. I'm really oh. feeling um, you're my mentor. You've inspired me to walk this journey. I'm walking it publicly because you are not ashamed. Um, one of the things that you have given me is, you know, we talk about people must not shame us. I am still the work, walking the journey of no shame, no stigma, me, because most of us are not talking because we self-shame, mm -hmm. you know, without even, because most of us are living with mental health behavioral challenges with people not even knowing about them. And we are not talking because we are self-shaming, self-judging. Um, I'm starting to fall in love with Utuli Mshungu, Tuli Silentoko, as she is. Yes. You know, yes. I'm walking my journey as I am. I am born again, loved by Christ. I will never be unborn again. I will never be unloved by God. Nothing I ever do, no condition that you can ever diagnose me with, no symptom can ever ever separate me from the love of God. And I am relishing in that at the moment. And because it took me a long time to get here, but it all started with stopping to shame myself. Nobody said I'm not a virtuous woman. I am the one who thought that I'm not a virtuous woman. I love mm. how I look in God's eyes right now. I'm wanting mm. to every day to look at myself. When I look at myself in the mirror, I imagine how God sees me. Remember, I'm created in his image. So how yeah. can I be wrong? How? Yeah. Wow. I'm excited. Wow. I am excited <laughs> at the moment. Um, oh, oh, I so love you, Pastor Darren. Hope, health, and healing. Yeah. I, I hold on to this so positively. And when I tell my story, just like you, I tell it with hope, health, and healing. It's not a lost cause. We are not a lost cause. Mm. It's not a lost cause. No, of course not. <laughs> you guys do beautiful work. I mean, like <laughs> truly, as Darren was saying, you are just amazing. You know, your 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 uh, movement of mustard. There's a lot because I also read. Uh, you know what you write, and I would make comments, and then we'll chat on the side. And um, of course, uh, uh, um, uh, Darren having read your book and also having invited you to come to 
uh, South Africa when we had the um, Deben uh, offering of the Essence Festival together with the Deben Business Fair and also just our, you know, chats, you know, because obviously we met um, as we were both attending the Hive program in uh, yes. Boston. It's for people that would like to make a difference in their communities. So I think the three of us you know, were in that journey of wanting to do something to, to help our communities become a better place. So um, let me uh, give you an opportunity, Mfundis, parting shot. <sighs> But thank you. I will do this as quickly as possible. Once again, thank you, Zagwa, for the opportunity. Thank you, all of the individuals, whether you're listening live or later. Uh, I want to say we love you. Uh, there is no shame and no blame as it relates to mental behavioral challenges. Uh, no weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. Uh, all of these things we know, you know, and we know that all things work together for the good of them who love God and who are called according to his purpose. Like, those are the things that I hold on to. And, and I do this work and, and hearing uh, the encouragement this morning uh, from Julia and saying how she was inspired, you know, many years and to, to walk this journey. You know, I, I saw it, you know, actually live out on, on social media, but you, we really don't know the impact we have on people. And that's why it's important that we continue to tell our story and to share our story. Uh, here, here's what I'll say. I think the comment was around integrating and on multiple levels. Here it is. Broad base partnerships uh, build better business. It's not even rocket science. I'm going to give you that one for free. Broad based partnerships build better business, period. And so when, because everything impacts everything, especially when you think about your business, think about the shift in the dynamic that companies are doing. You know, you may have been doing, you know, working extensively on tourism and now you're giving health products. You know, there's wonderful opportunities, right? So everything impacts everything. And as long as we understand that, and, it's, and those who, you know, are you at a place and you're, you're kind of teeter-tottering whether I should tell my story or share my story. Uh, well, the word says, this is talking about the church and connection. Uh, we have overcome, we are overcomers because of the blood of the lamb and Jesus has already died. But the other piece is our, our testimony. We have to say something. And for me, it's just like one of my unwritten rules. Like, you know, if the benefits outweigh the risk, then there are no risks. There, there's just no risk. Like if the benefits, if me sharing my story is going to help me to heal, because every time I do this process, like I am, I'm going global now because Zabwa has given me this platform and I'm telling everyone, here it is. So guess what? There's no shame and no blame. And so, you know, you don't have to whisper it anymore. If you're whispering it, I'm telling you, I wrote it in a book actually. And so that's the freedom we get. You know, we get this release and then, the, the other part of it is you're helping someone else. We have not been given this journey or this story for ourselves. This is ministry. This is ministry and we've been called to this for such a time as this. And we're the only ones who can do this. And so if you're living with a mental behavior cha behavioral health challenge, this is what we've been called to do. If you And if you feel what I'm feeling right now, I'm not saying everyone has to go out and do it, but there are specific people who God has chosen. And that's why, you know, even their paths will intersect. We've met in, in Boston, at Harvard, and, you know, and we talked about Essence. You heard the name of com my company was Akaya, which is a Zulu term. You know, how did I get that? How do I know that? You American little bald head man. I know it because I've been there and I was taught it by the people, the young people who taught me what the essence of Akaya means. And that's what we have to do. We have to continue that spirit of creating this sense of home, but in a deeper sense, the essence of Akaya. This, this is a very powerful Zulu word where we say that all are welcome. It doesn't matter who you are, where you've been, you're welcome here. Even if you're depressed, you're sad, you don't wanna say anything, you still have a seat at the table. We must be intentional about doing God's work. We must be intentional about loving. We must be intentional about affirming. We must be intentional about doing what God has called us to do. My name is Darren Al Harris. I love you guys. And remember, leaders who lead with love never lose. It's always a win-win, and we're in it tonight. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you so much, guys. Can I ask that you share your um social media handles, because I think after this, there's a lot of people that would like to maybe check out your uh, Facebook, um, Instagram, Twitter, you know. To Let's do a mental health uh, conference in Durban. Set it up. Let's go to Joe <laughs> Burger Cape Town.
Okay, I'm happy the power to be uh, listening. Whoever is happy to support and sponsor, they are, are listening to this conversation, hopefully. Chuli, your social media handles? Um, I think the most relevant is Masitete, um, where Masitete. I share my day-to-day -day journey with mental health, but also you can find me on Facebook, Tulisile Mchungu. Um, and on Instagram is Tulisile, I think, 406. Um, so I think, uh, parting short quickly, um, this is the face of mental health. You know, I am a woman who has a family. I am a woman who has children. I have businesses. I am living and thriving with a mental behavioral challenge because it's treated. So when Darren always said to me, so what? Please go get help. You know, you feel that you need to talk to somebody. Approach your mental health professional if there's anything that you do today. Um, yes, Darren said, we're not saying go out there and go start sharing your story publicly. The one thing I will ask you, start living your own life authentically. Don't hide from you. Don't yeah. hide from your pain. Live it out there because everything works out for good for those who love the Lord. I definitely love the Lord, so I trust him. I trust him with my journey. Trust him with yours. Amen. <laughs> Darren, you want to make handles? My handle really quick. Uh, I have a website that you can go to, uh, which is www.darren, that's D-A-R-R-I-N, lharris.com, or you can find me on social media, uh, whether it's uh, Instagram or yeah, just Darren L. Harris usually will bring it up on Facebook uh, because I have a public page as well as a, a private page. You'll find me. If you can't find me, go to Zabwa and you'll see you'll see me. You, <laughs> you're friends with Zabwa. So yeah. uh, I am on there. And my only parting words is, once again, thank you, Zabwa, for the opportunity. Um, thank you, uh, of course, all. I, I can't see all the ladies uh, and your son, part of the organization. Hey, everyone. Uh, you know, thank you for uh, behind the scenes work. And, you know, I know how challenging it must be to work and get these things done because we have someone who's uh, you know, all about excellence. So God will thank you for your excellence. This has been an excellent program, uh, excellent questions, uh, very emotional. And because this has happened, I want to say this, we probably opened some wounds. Yeah. Um, and here's where I'll shift a little bit from, you know, my bubbly personality, because even for me, I now have to do a few things. Because it, it, even though it gets easier as I share and tell my story, you know, and I don't have to relive it and you don't have to relive yours either, but it's really important that you have a point where you are a place or a person where you can decompress. Um, yeah. Because when you're telling your story, you know, you don't have to relive it, but you know, you're going to be retelling it. And some of those things and emotions and feelings are going to come up, but of course the medication and therapies, you know, and, and of course, the practice we all know, which is prayer, you know, yeah. and, and we know that if we keep our mind stayed on him, he would keep us in what? Perfect peace and be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. See, these are things, the mind is all throughout the Bible, right? And so I want to help you. And not only do I want to help you, but I want to hope you and say, you know, if this was a challenging subject for you, if there are things that were brought up, if there are feelings or emotions, you know, it's okay to feel those. But what's going to be important is that you get to your faith leader, that you get to your physician, or you get to someone. So if you know, even if we open those wounds, that's the you know that's one of the risks of having these conversations. And people are probably you're probably asking yourself some questions right now. You know, I'm hearing voices. You know, is this normal? Is this strange? I find myself talking to myself. You know, here's the time. You have the opportunity. There are resources online. Uh, of course, Dabo's uh, organization. Uh, Econo is a great organization. They can lead you. Uh, if you're in America, wherever, you know, they reach out to someone. The most important thing that I can tell you right now, because I know I have to do this after this. Like there, it was really emotional. And I I celebrate that you've given me the space. I'm 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 grateful for it. But at the same time, that you know, I want to go show some gratitude. You know, I want to go pray. I want to go meditate. You know, I'm gonna talk to my heavenly father and say thank you. Because uh, had it not been for you, you know, where would I be? You know? 
and there are many times. So I yeah. want to just encourage, and that's my handle. That's my word of encouragement. I want to say that, you know, talk to somebody, talk to somebody, say something, hashtag say something. We're going to bring that to yes. South Africa. Say, hashtag, hashtag say something. Are you, you use are that. You, are you hooking up or off into a new height? Hashtag new say hashtag. something. <laughs> South Africa is saying oh, something. Wow. That's it, too. Right. That's it. We're going to get that movement going wherever I need to help support. You know, if they won't let me get on the plane because of Corona, I'll have to swim across the ocean. But I know where you're at. And I love, love, love Durban, South Africa. I love you, South Africa. And uh, thank you once again. We love again. you. We love you, too, uh, Derek. Yeah, Bo. Oh, my word. Thank you so much. Live your truth. Pray. Live your truth. Pray. Because Jesus Christ came so that we can have this life and leave it abundantly, you know. Can so we pray on your program or is this illegal? We've got this. We've can, got can this. We, <laughs> can, we, can we pray on your program? Yeah, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Let us go before the Lord in prayer. Thank you, Lord God. Father and gracious God, Lord, we thank you this morning. God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity, God, to come before your presence and your throne. God, just once again to show our gratitude for everything that you've done for us. Father, we thank you for the conversation. God, we thank you for Econo for taking on this bold stance and, and helping us to reconcile, God, our reality with our religion, God. Helping us to understand that, God, you have come that we might have life and life more abundantly. You have shown us the way, God, and no weapon that is formed against us shall prosper because greater is he that is in us and he that is in the world. God, you, you, this is your word, God, and we stand on your word. God, we stand on your word because you are that great shepherd. So God, we're asking now that you would touch those that are under the sound of my voice, no matter where they are in the world, God. Touch them now, move on them, those who are living with past pains, God. Those are called resentments. God, those who are living with anger today, God, that, that's because it's happening right now in the present. And God, for those who are fearful about things that haven't happened, the future, God. Lord, these are some of the signs and symptoms, but God, we know that you can heal because it says in your word that by your stripes we are healed. It is already done. So, God, we claim the victory right now. God, we claim the victory over every diagnosis. God, we claim the victory over everything that has set someone back. And now, God, we're asking for your glorious wisdom, Father. For you said that if we lack it, we can ask you. So, God, we're asking for your wisdom. God, we're asking for your wisdom in this time. So if someone is hearing you right now, God, that you would give them the wisdom to go to a physician, to go to their doctors, to talk to their pastors, to talk to a counselor, and to be unafraid and unashamed. Because Jesus came, God, you've taken all the shame away. There is no shame in Christ. There's no shame in anything that you have created us to be. God, now may you turn our pain into our power. God, we'll go a little bit further. God, I'm going to pray that those who turn their pain into power, God, you would also give them the ability to turn it into profit. I'm just going to go ahead and speak that, God, because I know that, you know, you're a God who rewards us for our faithfulness. And to whom much is given, much is required. God, and we know that favor isn't fair, but favor does require faithfulness. For those of us who are on this journey, who are reaching out and sharing our story, telling our story, those who are on the front lines, those who are on the battlefield, who understand that we must tell our story because that is the way to the truth, that is the way to healing. And so, God, we ask that you would strengthen us on our journey now. Heal us, God, as wounded healers, God. God, may we be healed by our own words, but not just by our words, by our actions, just like those lepers who went. It says, as they went, they were healed. As they went, they were healed. So, God, as we go, heal us, God, of our depression. Heal us, God, of our diagnosis. Heal us, God, of our pain. 
heels of our oppression and the abuse, God. We believe in you, God. We trust in you today. And so, God, we already want to claim the victory. It's already done. In Jesus' name, God, we claim the victory, God. You've already given us the victory. We are made whole. We're not just healed, but, God, we have been made whole. Not only have we been made whole, but, God, our families have been made whole. Not only have our families been made whole, God, but our finances, God, our churches, God, our communities, our countries, our world will be made whole because we have been made whole. We thank you once again, God, for your precious love for your precious love, for your precious power. Oh God, we feel your strength even now. God, we honor you today and may you honor our work today. God, we pray that someone has heard something today. God, that is gonna change them. God, that's gonna give them hope, God. That is gonna stop them, God, from jumping. Stop them from slitting their wrists. God, stop them from hanging themselves. God, stop them from taking that gun God, I believe that someone has heard what they needed to hear. I'm going to claim it. And this is what you've called us to do. You said greater work shall we do. So, God, we thank you for this great work. God, help us and give us the strength. And, God, when we need to take a break, God, for you said that you would be our shepherd. And yea, though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we shall fear no evil, for you're with us. We're not ashamed. You're with us. We're not ashamed. You're with us. Yes, and so, God, we thank you. No shame. Yes, no blame. Yes, thank you. We yes, bless you. We praise yes, you. We yes, honor God. you. Yes, and, God, we're going forth now. As we give the benediction, we're going to do the work. Even though our worship service has ended, may our service begin and may our service be our worship and our worship our service. We're at church today. Thank you, God. Let's go do the work. I love you. <laughs> Mighty warrior, you are great in battle. Jehovah is your name. You are a mighty warrior, and you are great in battle. Jehovah is your name. My name is Zodra Msimanga Nsibande Umagoche. Thank you for joining us on this uh, ITG Conversations. I would promise you that we are coming back again next week, Thursday. Thank you to my amazing, amazing, amazing Thank guests. You. Thank you guys for making the time, for sharing your story. It's open, it's there. Well, <laughs> there is hope, there is help, there is healing. Thank yes. you so much. May God you. bless you abundantly. <laughs> Yebo. Yebo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.